Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first board meeting of 2023. Oh, these years are going by so fast. Uh, we're going to stand and have our Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Tamara McIntosh, which will be followed with an invocation by Chaplain Johnny Jones. Let's leave allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May we bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being the almighty God who holds the entire world it cradles our heart. Today, we humbly recognize the need for your guidance, and how we crave your light to shine down. The path is dim and unclear. Without your voice to order our steps, the journey would be confusing and obscure. Show us the movement to mirror your will. Reveal the master blueprint as only you can, so that we may boost in your glory and plan. We thank you, Lord, as we embark upon a new year, Lord, that you would be our guide, that you would be that beacon light upon the hill, that as we travel through this path, that you would be our guide and our director. Whatever we do, Lord, let it be to glorify you. And that as we embark upon our duties and tasks for our city, for our nation, for our country as a whole in the world, we pray that we have an impact on whatever decision we make through this coming year, that it may impact the lives of not only our city, but the whole world. And we will be careful to give you the glory and honor in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we have a board resolution. Right here. Whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr has faithfully served the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department since 2000. And whereas, as a police officer, Joseph E. Maben Jr. served at the Central Patrol Division and Police Athletic League. And whereas, Joseph E. Maben Jr. was promoted to detective in 2006 and served in the Internal Affairs Unit. And whereas, Joseph E. Maben Jr. was promoted to sergeant in 2007 and held numerous patrol and investigative assignments, including Metro Patrol Division, the Homicide Unit, the Street Crimes Undercover Squad, and the Violent Crimes Intelligence Squad. And whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr. was promoted to captain in 2016 and held assignments in the Chief's Office, Robbery Unit, Training Unit, and with the Metro Patrol Division, Watch 3. And whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr. was promoted to major in 2020 and commanded the Shoal Creek Patrol Division and the Violent Crimes Division. And whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr. was promoted to deputy chief in 2021, where he commanded the Investigations Bureau. And whereas following Chief Richard C. Smith's retirement, Joseph E. Maben Jr. was appointed by the Board of Police Commissioners and sworn in as Kansas City, Missouri's 47th Police Chief on April 22nd, 2022, and served in this interim capacity until December 15th, 2022, when Stacy Graves was sworn in as Chief of Police. And whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr. 
received a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University in Tallahassee, Florida, and is a graduate of the 281st session of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And whereas during Joseph E. Maben Jr.'s notable and distinguished career with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, he has earned a special unit citation and numerous commendations, including awards for good conduct, physical fitness, safe driving, and firearms proficiency. Whereas Joseph E. Maben Jr. has been an outstanding member and leader of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department and has exemplified those qualities which are found in the finest law enforcement executives throughout the country. And whereas the Board of Police Commissioners greatly appreciates Joseph E. Maben's interim service as the department's chief of police and looks forward to his continued service in his role as deputy chief over the patrol bureau. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Police Commissioners of Kansas City, Missouri hereby expresses its sincere gratitude and genuine appreciation for Joseph E. Maben Jr.'s distinguished and tireless service to the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, it's truly an honor. Uh, I, I feel so privileged that you placed your trust in me to lead this department while we're in transition and searching for the next chief. Uh, it's a uh, highlight of my career to lead this department and the men and women and to continue to serve my community. And I continue to do that uh, in my present role now, but, but thank you. I, I, it's, it was beautiful. It was like a, a eulogy. I, <laughs> it was a funeral or a board meeting? What are we doing? <laughs> no, thank you. Well, we appreciate your time, and it, it was just a calming atmosphere uh, during your time as interim chief, and uh, it, it takes uh, special gifts and talents, and so we really appreciate it, and I hope there's a plaque or something coming eventually so that we can present you with something other than just a, 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 a writing, but uh, it, it was certainly not a eulogy. And it was certainly not a departing speech, but just to show our appreciation to you. Uh, any other board members have anything to say? There is something in Mark Twain or Huckleberry Finn, I can't remember, where they sneak in and hear their own fun funeral. It'd be that same sort of perspective, but we want you staying. And it's really nice to see all of the new deputy chiefs, all the new colonels, and of course, some that have been here a while. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And like everybody said, it was a pleasure working with you. We appreciate your service and everything you've done. And keeping everything calm was nice as well. Um, just thank you. Great job. All right. Mayor Lucas, uh, City Council uh, Mayor's designee for today. We are starting back with the first district. That will be Councilwoman Heather Hall. But she will need to join us next month uh, due to a conflict with this month. So thank you, Bishop. All right. Thank you. Uh, Investigation Bureau, Deputy Chief Luis Ortiz. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did, sir. All Thank right. you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. My information is under tab B in your books. You also have a hard copy of the daily homicide analysis report, also known as the blue sheet in front of you. If you refer to that document, you will see that we had 11 homicides so far in 2023 compared to 14 in 2022. That's a difference of three. And the five-year average on that is year to date is 12. So we are one down from the previous years. Please also note that in 2021, we had 10 homicides, 16 homicides in 2020 by this time, and nine homicides in 2019. We clear four homicides in the current year and we also clear one homicide from the previous year. So for the total of five homicides for this year. 
Commissioners, you also have a copy of the non-fatal shooting comparison report. You will note that from January 1st to January 30th, 2023, there were 38 non-fatal shooting victims. In 2022, we had 42 victims during the same time period. So we're down 10% compared to last year. In December 2022, we had 38 non-fatal shooting victims compared to 30 in December of the previous year. That was a 27% increase for the month. Now, commissioners, please direct your attention to the December 2022 non-fatal shooting report listed under tab B on page two. You will see on your report that of the night or the 38 non-fatal shooting victims in December 2021 20, were cooperative. That's a 55% of victims cooperating with the police department at the time that report was taken or that offense was taken. Black males accounted for the highest number of non-fatal shooting victims with 19 or 50%. White males were second with eight victims or 21%. Black females were third with seven victims, which is 18%. And the remaining four victims, which is 11%, was white females. The age groups with the highest number of known fatal shooting victims was 25 to 34 and 45 and over with nine each. 18 to 24 was second with eight and two groups had the remaining with six each. And that was the 35 to 44 and the 17 and younger age groups. We identified 10 suspects. Six suspects were black males and three were white females and one was a white male. There were four suspects in the age group of five to 34 and three suspects in the age group of 35 to 44 and one in each of the age groups of zero to 17, 18 to 24 and 45 and over. On page five, you will see the Recover Firearms Report. We recovered 142 firearms in December 2022 compared to 148 in December 2021. The five-year average recovery in December is 158. We also recovered 2516 firearms between January 1st and December 31st. On the next few pages, you will find monthly case submissions and disposition reports. We submitted a total of 259 cases to county prosecutors. 217 of those cases were to Jackson County, 32 to Clay County, and 10 to Platte County, zero to Cass County. Prosecutors filed charges in 77 cases during the month. 32 cases were charged in custody and 45 warrants were issued. 23 cases were returned for additional work and 82 cases were declined. Please note that these numbers also include cases that were submitted during previous months but returned in December. Declinations, Special Investigations Division had 45 cases declined, 16 for violent crimes, 16 for property crimes, five for traffic and zero for bomb and arson. 74 of the 82 declinations were from Jackson County. Prosecutor discretion was the most cited reason for declination with 42, followed by additional police action needed with 23. We continue to encourage the public to come up with any information about any missing person or any information they might have about their loved ones. If there's anybody out there, please come forward. We'll be happy to, to take that report and initiate the investigation. Unless you have any questions, that's all for me. Any questions? I'll speak briefly and uh, wonderful congratulations, Deputy Chief Ortiz with Felicidades. That's all I will say for now. <laughs> I like it. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I understand that um, through some collaborative efforts near the end of 2022, we were able to clear a good number of cases uh, with the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office, working mm -hmm. with them, I believe, in the homicide unit. Could you talk just a little bit about that? I'm mainly highlighting it to commend you and uh, hope that we see that work going forward. Absolutely. And 
Thanks for that, Mayor. Yes, Jackson County prosecutors and us worked on December 30th, 30th and December 31st, and we clear out 10 more cases. That's how we ended up to, with a percentage of 60, about 62% of clearance rate for the whole year. But it was there, the communication that we have in the working relationship that we're establishing with Jackson County prosecutors that made that possible and their willingness to work with us on that. So they did a tremendous job on that. Mm -hmm. what, what additionally did you do? Did everybody meet and decide that there are 10, there are 10 or 20 cases that are outstanding and, and in some way that you feel like there was more work to be done? What's the, what was kind of the encouragement for them? Some of those cases, we knew that we were waiting for a response on their part and they were on their review. And we just asked them if they could relook at those cases again. And they did. And they gave us an answer on that. So thank you. I noticed that for the uh, year, though, year or I guess it was yearly declinations for Jackson County for homicide, though, there were 30 dec declinations. And those could be self-defense. The majority of those are going to be self-defense. And when they decline those charges, it's because they won't be able to put a case or charges on, on the suspects that we identified at that time. Can we, is there any way to break those down, what the definition is for? So we can, you know, it gives us a better idea as to how we're doing it. Absolutely. We'll do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Patrol Bureau, Deputy Chief uh, Mabin. Good morning again. My information is under tab C in your books. I'd like to direct your attention to the first page, which is the department-wide median response time report. This report shows the median time elapsed between when a call is created until an officer arrives. As you can see, the top chart, chart shows the median response times for priority 10 calls. You may also hear to us refer to those as priority one calls. These are the calls that present extreme danger to human life, known danger to human life, or potential danger to human life. Examples include shootings, sexual assaults in progress, armed robberies just occurred. The bottom chart shows priority 20 calls, and you, we may hear us refer to these as priority two calls. These are calls where the potential for danger or injuries to occur exists, but has not yet happened. Examples include prowlers, bomb threats, disturbances, uh, security holding a person for shoplifting. And you can see the, the response times there, that's department wide. And if you go to the next two pages and on your screens, you'll see these calls broken down um, out by division. It shouldn't be a surprise that CPD has the fastest response time because it's only 15.4 square miles, which is by far the smallest division area-wise on the department. There's no questions on that. I, I want to understand about the times. It says from the time the call is received until the officer arrives. Correct. Is that when they very first call and they're put on not hold, I don't remember what you said, it was, they get a message. Is it from that time or from the time that they actually talk to someone? My understanding is when they actually talk to someone. <clears throat> so we're still having wait times before they talk to somebody. Uh, we, that's, we can get that information. That's one of the items that you've asked for in the past. And we're, yes. we're working on compiling those statistics. Um, it's a heavy lift, so we're working on getting those those numbers for you. Our machines don't tell us when the call. <clears throat> we can we can get the, we'll we'll get okay. it we'll get it for okay. you. Thank you. Yep. And as we re, uh, remarked in the past, you know, we have a certain call level that we can reach. You know, if we have twenty eight calls come in at the same time, then that's when you get that that message. But uh, yeah, we're working on efficiencies there and to get you that uh, that data. Well, but yeah, yeah, you're right. This is this is from the time that. You know, hello, 911, and then they start placing the call, and then the officer arrives to your door. Okay. Because 
it, it'd be great if you just say that nobody's getting that message and then right. you wouldn't have to give me those numbers. Right. Yep. Commissioner, may I jump in? Sure. Um, our average um, wait time is 27 seconds from the time the person calls. Um, if a dispatcher or a call taker doesn't answer, um, they get a recording saying this, please 911, do not hang up um, before a dispatcher or a call taker answers and then places that call into the system to dispatch an officer. So the average is 27 seconds. That, that's not what we've been hearing. Many people put on hold and, you know, we had this discussion last meeting. And in fact, in some of the reports I was reading, uh, we're now 34 call takers down. I saw somebody send an email and said, why is everybody so concerned about call takers? Because that's the feeder. <laughs> And until we get that right, everything else is not right. And so um, I, I just don't think that the evidence of what normal people tell me uh, says that 27 seconds, and you know, it's a hot button with me. I don't want to tell my story again, but um, I, I hope that it's something that we're really working on, Chief. And we are, and if you need police or fire immediately, 27 seconds could feel like 10 minutes. Well, and an average could right. be five minutes and one second. I mean, right. so I want to know those numbers. And I'd be delighted if they never had to hear that machine. And the bishop's right. One of our public comments that was sent in said, you know, you keep harping on wanting to pay the uh, dispatchers more and get more dispatchers. And we do because that's how the community contacts us. And if we don't have people answering those phones, then people who need help aren't getting help. So I want all of our people to be paid well and taken care of well, but we have to have people that are saying 911 and we'll be there. So thank you for that, but it needs to be better. I agree. Thank you. Now, if we uh, direct your attention to the page five, and it's on the screen, the 2022 traffic summary report, you'll see that citywide total crash statistics. In 2022, there were 18,346 reported vehicle accidents. That's a 4.2% decrease from 2021 when there were 19,145 vehicle accidents. However, as you can see on page eight and also on the bottom of your screen, we ended the year with 89 traffic fatalities. That's a 4.7% increase over 2021 where there were 85 traffic fatalities. The next sc screen, page 11, shows some statistics regarding these tragic incidents. One thing that stands out is in 2022, 54% of those killed as a passenger or driver in a car, SUV or truck, were not wearing seat belts. And in another 23% of those cases, seat belt use could not be determined by investigators. There is a silver lining though. As of yesterday, there were three traffic fatalities this year compared to nine at the same time last year. So what can we learn from this? If you wear your seat belt, you're much more likely to su survive an accident. Seatbelts save lives. That's a great message that we need to be saying more often. That was the first thing I saw on the first report when I became a commissioner. And they said, you mean to tell me people aren't wearing their seatbelts? And all of you, yes, they're not wearing their seatbelts. They've got to wear their seatbelts. I mean, it's like your mother making you eat your spinach. You just got to <laughs> do it. And it's easier than eating spinach. It's important. Um, excuse me. And reducing ta traffic fatalities remains one of our highest priorities in the Patrol Bureau. Uh, we will continue to conduct traffic enforcement operations and educational campaigns, like you mentioned, seatbelts, to make our streets safer. In fact, next month, the Traffic Division will report on what they are doing to identify people who are driving under the influence of narcotics. Uh, that's especially important since uh, the changes in recreational marijuana uh, use. But we'll have a, a further report on that next week. You have any other questions on the traffic report? 
At this time, uh, we'll have a brief presentation on community engagement division. By the way, the, both, both of you so far, and I assume others are going to, I like having the page out of our report on the screen for everyone to see. It helps me find my place faster and it's, it's helpful to the audience. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope that everyone is doing well today. So the Community Engagement Division 30-Day Checkup. Where do I begin? The absolutely dynamic men and women uh, that have transitioned into this new normal are continuing in the business of service in this city for this city. The last 30 days, we have seen Christmas events sponsored by the East Patrol Division bringing in approximately 400 families uh, for their blue holiday event. 400 turkeys and 400 toys. Uh, the Police Athletic League Christmas event brought in over 500 families. The South Patrol Division and their interaction officers with their social services workers as well as department volunteers dressed up as characters reminiscent of the movie Polar Express and hosted a movie night which brought in approximately 80 community members and was a huge success and has become a yearly tradition. North Shoal and CPD to include Metro also did outstanding work for families in their divisions for Christmas. The Community Engagement Division has also serviced families in the midst of unbelievable tragedy. We have assisted two families recently who have lost a loved one um, and assisted with transportation of their cherished family member out of state. Further, we have also assisted a, a community member in our city uh, with a safe relocation out of town for their safety. In the last 30 days, ladies and gentlemen, we have added more members to the Community Engagement Division. We now have the Youth Services Unit. They are now a part of our all of our all-star team. That includes our student resource officers, our DARE officers, as well as our PAL officers. So this is the show me state, right? I can show you better than I can tell you. So let's check it out. So that was just a snippet. Can I get a, a round of applause for my CED? Can I get a round of applause for my CED? 
And so lastly, ladies and gentlemen, within some of the snippets, you saw a lot of our community partners as well involved with us. So we are grateful, thankful, and blessed to have many of our community partners. Some are here today that represent what it really means to be part of Kansas City. We are a family. So in that last clip, guys, there was a team you saw there. So the Pal Panthers. We have not had a basketball team at the Pal Center in years. And these fourth and fifth graders are five and O. Oh, okay? Mm -hmm. So in that picture you saw, uh, we had also our assistant new coach, <laughs> Chief Graves, was there giving them a pep talk. So to Coach Elena Swaggart. Sweetheart, you are the real MVP. She loves on these young men, and they are 5-0 and oh because of her. Coach Brandon Walker, Coach Susie Fabian, we are grateful for all of you. And also, Coach Dion Renty, thank you for your support. So, if I can, a little latitude to Pee Wee, Snacks, Devin, a.k.a. Steph Curry, Munchies, Doobie, Rico, a.k.a. Dennis Rodman, Noodles, Isaiah, <laughs> a.k.a. Izzy. You are remarkable, and we are so proud of you, young men. To Jamie, Garen, Andrew, Ashley, Tammy, Kathy, and Susie, thank you for your dedication and your leadership to the men and women of the Community Engagement Division. Are there any questions? Great presentation. Thank Great you. job, and thank, and thank you. I have to say, um, going to the Pal Panthers game this weekend, it was really fun. It, they were actually like super fun to watch. They were down... 7 to 14 and then they came back. I think they won by 8. Um and just just going over there and talking to them, um telling them how proud of of them that we are. And um there was three kiddos on the bench and one of them asked, um so are you the chief of police or are you over all police officers? I said yes and they said well, Susie Fabian, she said that she was a boss. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, she's the boss of, of this. And then they said, okay, so you can tell any police officers, like, if you told somebody to go do 100 push-ups, you go do it. And I said, yeah. And they go, I said, well, you want me to have somebody do some push-ups? They're like, yeah. Walker. Have Walker go do one jumping jack. I go, okay, watch this. And I walked over to Brandon Walker, and I was like, do one push-up. He was like looking at the team <laughs> and then they all laughed it was just so much fun i would encourage any of our um kcpd members to to make one of those games it, it's a good time it, it's it's a good support and um they were just fun to watch i just wanted to add that <laughs> awesome well i think that's a great thing for our community and it just brings that foundation to these kids that they might not get so i'm so excited to to see this happening thank you all right, thank you. Uh, is that it for your presentation? That's it for Patrol Bureau. All right, thank you. Thank you. Administration Bureau, Deputy Chief Doug Niemeyer. Well, hopefully uh, I can bring you some good news on recruiting. Um, having moved seats, uh, I didn't totally understand the hiring process and everything that went on because that was not my division. It is now. And I do understand, and I hope uh, I didn't jump in earlier, but I think I'm going to bring you some good numbers and good news and the processes that we're changing to make the changes that you're asking for. Um, mind you, we've only had 28 days, but I I'm I want to say before we start and hear these numbers, thank you to the to the folks who work in HR, the folks who work in recruitment. I've asked them, um, I've demanded of them to make some make some difference and make some change and they've they've done they've done it in a very short amount of time. So with that being said, <clears throat> the hundred I'll start with the academy. The academy is now under this bureau. Uh, the 176 classes is, is in in the academy. They, they have 25 recruits. They started with 26 with you're under what tab? Oh I'm sorry. Tab D. <clears throat> tab D. Um, so we have we have 25 recruits in that class and they are to graduate on May the 4th. We just started our next class, which is the 177th. It started January the 23rd. It has five recruits in it, and it will graduate on August the 3rd. The 178th class will be our fourth class of the year, and it begins on April the 24th. And this is what I will say to that is this is the class. You have to have your numbers into post, uh, early so that they can qualify to get into our um, academy uh, through post. 
right now we have approximately 41 people in the process. Uh, on January the 21st, we, we held a uh, test. 27 people showed up to take the test. All 27 passed the physical abilities test. 20 of them passed the written. We have offered the seven who not passed the written jobs within the department uh, with the idea that they, they take a, a job, a different job, and then we can have them retest for law enforcement. So that was a, that was held on Saturday, January the 21st. And it was impressive to, to see that many folks there that day. Um, I will say yesterday, even these numbers of, or these numbers now are changing daily. Uh, uh, I want to thank Ruth Stewart. She sends them to me. I, we used to get them once a week. I'm, I'm literally getting them every day. Yesterday I signed off to hire four new hires, two laterals and two call takers just yesterday. That was in one day that we were getting through. And I'd like to announce today, and this is important, and this was a request that came out of the HR unit is, can you please tell us the dates that we're having classes so when we're recruiting people, they'll know when they might have an opportunity to have a job. So just this week with the, with the help of the executive command staff and, and the chief, the next academy, April the 24th, that's the 178th class. The next academy after that will be July the 23rd, which will be the 179th class. That gives people, uh, we do have people that we're processing that will be graduating um, college or other, or, or other institutions. And that lets them know that where we plan to begin uh, that next class so that they can, they can have an idea. We sat down and we discussed recruitment and recruiting. And we've done things the same way for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask for the mayor's help on this, especially. As a team, we, we are not seen at, at many events. I go to many events around the city as, as others do. And why, why is the police department there, not there? Example, uh, these are just some ideas and these are not set in stone uh, because there are things we have to work out. We have the Big 12 basketball tournament coming here. Not only should we be at the Big 12 basketball tournament for the men's, we have the women's tournament at Municipal Auditorium. We just need to get the city's permission to get in there. Uh, we have the NAIA tournament. It's a Municipal Auditorium. We just need the end to get there. Um, we have the NFL draft coming. We should be there. Uh, we already work uh, KC Current. Uh, we, we already went over to <laughs> on the Kansas side. Uh, I talked to our group. We already did that. We have the stadium coming. We should be at every game. These are opportunities that we have to be in front of people at large events, large numbers, and be there. So, yeah, I mean, if we want to be inside the T-Mobile Center, you've got to work with them to be able to set up a, a spot. But municipal is the same way. Um, that all goes to certain vendors pay X amount of dollars to do this, others. But when, when it's inside of a public facility that's owned by – by, by the city, um, we got to work with those folks in order to have that. So that's what I'm reaching out. I, I just wanted to bring that up today. So if your folks hear something at conventions, <clears throat> I, I think municipal still under conventions. I'm not mm -hmm. positive, but we, we need to be put those people in touch with us and say, hey, we're, we're, we have the women's. That's a great, I, I have daughters. Great idea. I, mm -hmm. my, my daughters go to a lot of those events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they go to, uh, my, my oldest daughter and her partner go to, all of this, all the soccer games. And that's, that's where this come from. Believe it or not, a lot of this recruiting uh, and, and different ideas on how we recruit folks uh, has come with me sitting down talking to my adult children, you know, <laughs> uh, they're 25. I ask them, you know, <laughs> if you're looking for a job, how are you going to do it? it? It's, it's so far removed from what we were doing. So right. I really have had those conversations with them. And, and say, this is what we're doing. And they're like, we would never find you, Dad. I'm like, okay, we got to change. So we have made a lot of changes in the last 30, 28 days. We look to, look to make a lot more. But I just wanted to give you an idea of what we've, they have done, we have done. There is more to come in the next month as far <clears throat> as we have a lot of people in the process. I just told you we have 41 people in the law enforcement process alone. Um, something else that you will see is uh, happening is – 
we have had a large number, and I don't have the number for you on this because they, they need to compile it. It's something that I requested out of them is rehires. We have a lot of people who left this department who are asking to come back. And, and we've seen that. Everybody that's sitting here has seen that throughout their career at some point in time or another where officers left, uh, whether it be years ago when we were in hiring freezes years ago and people left and went to the Kansas side, or there was a point in time where uh, a lot of people left to go to the railroad. Um, all the We are getting applicants back that are like, we want to come back and work for the, your department. That's a good thing. So um, I think that you'll see our numbers go up quite a bit from there. So I'd like to ask, is there any other questions? Um, I, um, I know uh, President Tolbert had an, a good meeting, I know, with uh, Major Barnes, um, Sergeant Betty Ocko. Right. I think uh, the communications unit was there. I don't know if you want to – I was not there personally, so I don't know if you want to address that, but I, I know that was a good meeting. It was a very good meeting, and I don't have a follow-up. I do see Ms. Basil here. I don't know if there's been any follow-up from that meeting we had. It, you can come up to the to the mic. Um, I don't have a lot of follow up, but uh, we're still working to coordinate monthly meetings. Unfortunately, uh, with this past Thursday, I wasn't able to make the meeting because of a situation uh, that occurred in our unit. Um, they're going to send me the resumes that they received from that day. Um, and then I'm still waiting on the MOU uh, from them to coordinate some internships within our unit. Okay, good. Did, did, did we talk to you about the MOU? Not yet? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I have a um, meeting at 3 o'clock because I'm on the CMA board, Convention Management Association. <laughs> so I'll be over at the convention center and I'll talk with them. But any comments on uh, how we make that happen? Because I think it's a great idea. Big 12 Women's League NFL draft. Right. No. Um, first of all, I want to I want to thank the deputy chief for bringing up these ideas. I have great confidence in our chief of police, and I see that her appointment here was a good one. I'm I'm enjoying learning ideas from your adult children, uh, <laughs> and and you was that's that's the best way to do it. I know. I also want to just briefly, you know get on topic. Uh, Deputy Chief Niemeyer, I've appreciated working with you for some time now. When I was on the city council, when you were there, I think you did fine work at the Executive Services Bureau um, at sometimes challenging times. And I know you'll address this task with that same energy. Uh, President Tolbert, absolutely. Uh, we are we are happy to try to make even more opportunities for the police department to have a presence. And I will make sure I keep talking to the deputy chief, particularly in this regard. I was at a retirement event for the fire chief the other day, and uh, they are already planning in the event. And I'm not like other mayors, so I ain't going to get ahead of myself. But to the event extent we ever have other parades or anything like that. Uh, and they weren't planning necessarily their presence in terms of their public safety apparatus, but where are their trucks in the parade itself? Please. Where are, we, we just talked about this yesterday. Don't steal our idea. <laughs> we were going to keep that one under wraps. <laughs> right. And so I, I would encourage us to make sure, to the deputy chief's point, that no matter where there is any big congregation of persons, and I appreciate you going over to KCK for um, outreach with the current games and all of that. Any place where people get to see what I believe to be the premier police department in our region and see that there are opportunities there and there are good people there, we make sure that we have a, a, a big, bold presence. And so I will make sure that we create that opportunity both at T-Mobile Center, Municipal Auditorium, Bartle Hall, um, any other places where we have some influence. I would also encourage us with our BKCPD campaign to make sure there's a presence even at places where we might not expect people. You know, a, a poster outside of the USO lounge at the new airport terminal where I was yesterday, for example, comes to mind. And, and we can find a way to get you there with a good rate. And so those sorts of things, I look forward to working with you on that. I know it's been 30 days, but I think we'll make good moves there. Uh, I also think that we should look for a kiosk or some kind of display other than just a little tent. Because if we're making this push, we want to make it look exciting, yep. you know, to come to be with the uh, KCPD. So great may ideas. I, may I ask a, a question and, and 
And it's interesting because communications is always described as, as different things. But communications, of course, is in some ways in law enforcement, particularly traditionally, very information based, getting people details they need. But as I see it, and I think as the deputy chief recognizes as well, it's also who we are, what we do, see us out and about. I, I know in past conversations we had talked about perhaps more videos and social media presences relating to getting people to want to be a Kansas City, Missouri police officer, dispatcher, or employee. Kind of where are those efforts now? And are we we just had there? a meeting on Friday with um, the firm that's going to work with us to elevate the image of Kansas City and specifically KCPD. So we are working on that. We're having conversations, and um, we're moving right along. I, I, I wish it could happen sooner, but yeah, <laughs> I think my, my foot on the gas is a little <laughs> bit a little bit too fast. But we're working on that. And I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna talk about it till next month. And I think I, I'm gonna say it later that uh, in February I hope to give you a, a better report. I mean, we're gonna we need to redo some of the things on our website. Uh, some of the, I mean. Again, when you talk, you have to sit down and talk to folks that, of the age of the mm -hmm. people we'd be hiring. Um, you know, you only get three clicks. I, I don't, mm. I'm not, I don't play on my phone. I don't play on the computer. That's just not who I am. But my daughters do. Mm -hmm. You get three clicks. And after three clicks, if you don't have that information that they need, you're done. Absolutely. So I... I do commend, and they're not, they're both working today, but if they were watching, I give a lot of the credit to my two daughters <laughs> is sitting down whenever I have, when I hear what we're doing and they say, dad, you're missing it. You're, you guys are missing it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a lot of the changes and, and it's not just my, my daughters. It's, I, I talk to a lot of young, young people and, and, and learn from that. And we, people that are my age, a lot of times have always been, this is how we do things and we can't do things and try to hire people it a different way so we're going to change yeah. and we have changed and yeah. with that being said um i, I would like I, I and i know uh deputy chief mccollum is going to talk much more about communications he and i have talked about it extensively but i would like to say i said i i signed off to hire two call takers yesterday in hr but the actual number is we have we have besides those two we have five additional job offers out with one that's already accepted. That's, that means a, six, a total of six plus the two yesterday is eight. Those are the, we're moving at a much quicker pace is what I'd like to tell you. So that's a lot. Do your daughters need jobs? No, ma'am. <laughs> uh, so. I've tried. Uh, I have tried. One, one got her degree in special education and the other one is going to pharmacy school. So uh, they, they didn't want to follow in the path of their dad. So I did have a couple questions and great job on all your great ideas. I'm really looking forward to that and seeing those numbers go up. But one of my concerns is the five that we have going through now. And I know with the holidays and everything and in people mm -hmm. moving positions, that's part of why that number is down. Um, but I did hear that we are losing eight this month and I'm concerned about retention. And I know we had talked about putting together a, program for that. I think that that would be really critical right now as far as trying to keep some of these people that we already have on and not lose them because, you know, it's it's going to take us a long time to get caught up. And if we're losing them at eight a month and now these five aren't graduating now for a while um, and the next class doesn't start till April and hopefully we'll have a Super Bowl parade, <laughs> I think maybe that's something we need to really address seriously. And I, I think we are are going to address those concerns. I think I think it goes back to the same thing of, of changing seats a little bit to understand where we are. I, I didn't totally understand. I, I mean, I was in fiscal. I didn't totally understand the HR process or the re recruitment process myself because you you have so much going on in your bureau. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and and moving forward, when you talk about losing eight, we're gonna we're gonna lose on average the same each month. Uh, and Are we traditionally, talking about losing dispatchers or oh, no, 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 no. Officers. officers okay. um, throughout yeah. the year, whether it's retirement, moving on, <laughs> other, yeah. no, um, but something else that's in here, uh, and I'm kind of getting out of order because I kind of got excited about all the things that we're doing, but we've hired seven laterals as well. We are seeing a large uptick in laterals 
uh, since the end of October, we've hired seven. Uh, five are already out on the street. Two are there. And then I signed off on those two that I told you about yesterday. So trend is turning to Excellent. where we are. I hope it continues. I have I don't have a way to know yet, but we, the laterals and rehires is, in my opinion, that's the fastest way to put people back out on the street is lateral and rehires. Right. But it's also important um, if you look at, at, at our numbers, and, and I'll start doing that next month, uh, look at the percentage of numbers and years on the job. You know, uh, when I first got promoted and we talked about in fiscal and we were losing people, almost 30% of our, our workforce was eligible for retirement. And it happened. Um, you know, that number's down to, I, I don't know it's in here somewhere, but it's like down to 13%. So we had, we had a, a large amount of people that were eligible and they did do that. Um, those numbers are evening out now. I don't have it directly in front of me, and I'll I'll make sure I post it next. But it shows one to five years, five to ten years, ten to fifteen. How our workforce is spread out instead of being heavy in that one category. Well, and I love your idea about the rehires because I think that's that would be a great idea and easy to get them on board quick. Also, I know Raymore. I heard that they're giving their reserves pay. That might be something we can look into as well to bring back some officers that, you know, might uh, entice them as well. So a couple different ideas there. Uh, We're also going to work with labor to potentially form like a retention committee. That way we can get ideas and reasons or um, just basically things we can do to retain the majority of our personnel and rank and file. Great. Love mm -hmm. that. And then we need to get that pay up there because that's part of those clicks. That's one of the first things these young kids look at. Any any more questions on recruitment or? Just a, just a very brief comment. And uh, this was a, a good presentation. And if your first 30 days are this good, I look forward to seeing day 120 and all that we've accomplished by then. Um, I, will, I will note this. You know, I have the fortune of doing a ride along Center Patrol Division sometime in the past month. Don't remember when exactly. And your point is very well taken on uh, the mind of a, somebody in their mid 20s, because even being with our, our junior officers, I was learning even information obtaining in ways very different than <laughs> perhaps how we're either getting it or engaging with things. So I, I'm excited, Chief, that we're doing some of that outreach uh, with others. And as you described the website, Deputy Chief, I think if you go on it now, see the skyline, like you can see a thousand different things. Your point is very well taken. People are on phones. They wanna see pictures of other humans. They wanna interact in a way that's not just, this is where you click on to see our bios. Nobody cares about our bios actually. Right. So you can right. bury that even further. Some do, but not many. Um, and yeah. particularly not the people who we're trying to hire for the most part. So I, I thank you for that. And uh, I will just, I'm, I'm very uh, excited with, I think, what you have described so far, the energy we have. I said this in a prior meeting. I also think it is fair game for us. The commissioner notes that Raymore has signing bonuses. Everybody else has a lot of things, and a lot of them I think are often marketed towards our officers, um, including outside of this region sometimes. I think it is very fair for us to share the excitement, the engagement, the professionalism and the diverse opportunities you have in this department and for us to go into our suburban communities and, and elsewhere to really share people, share with people what KCPD is all about. So what I'm saying is you find yourself at a college football game somewhere far from us. I got your back. If uh, local in Manhattan, Kansas or Columbia, Missouri says, what are you doing here? You know, I think this is kind of the nature of things now in recruiting. So. Well, speaking of, we uh, we actually do have a really good I, – I know uh, our recruitment folks have a really good relationship with K-State. Uh, they're yeah. headed out there. They, I just signed off on that as well for them to go to K-State. Uh, they, they have a rapport. Um, I mean, it, it, that, that's, what, that's what this is really going to be about is relationships. And I'll say this again. Uh, I've said it last year through every in-service. I will say it again. <clears throat> our best recruiters are our employees. Mm -hmm. It would only take – we implemented it a year ago uh, to pay our employees if they if they recruit someone. It would it would take right at ten percent of our employees, only ten percent of our employees to recruit one person. We'd be we'd be up to I don't know the exact number. We'd be up to well ten percent is another hundred eleven. Be up to 
almost 1,250 officers. And, that, and that's just officers. If only 10% recruited one person. And that's that's really one of the number one ways to recruit. And I, and I said that at in-service last year. So I will continue to say that as well, as well as do with these events. So I encourage our folks to, to do the same and recruit. Everyone needs to recruit, not just our recruiting, not just this bureau. Everyone in this department needs to recruit, uh, even outside. So that's the, that's the, I'll end with that on that part, but I do want to give you the end of the year numbers because it's, that's what we've normally done. And mind you, these are December the 31st numbers uh, to end the year. And I'm going to try to find a way to keep these up to date. And I looked, most of the board meetings are at the end of the month. So our, our numbers are going to really be a month behind all the time mm -hmm. throughout this year if we can't figure out another way to do it with the payroll system and other things. But end of year numbers, uh, law enforcement was 1,115 compared to 1,159 at the end of 2021. Um, our professional staff was 505 compared to 507 at the end. Of I already spoke of the laterals and the rehires. Uh, the, the goal is to have a very large class in April. And at the February board meeting, I hope I can give you a true assessment of the changes that we've made and, and update the board on what we're doing on, on all of our hiring processes. Um, I do want to thank, uh, I, I really do want to thank the folks that work down there. They, they had a lot of good ideas and, and we implemented some of those, but they have had to really change what they're doing to make. I've, I've encouraged them to see what we can do for this April class along with the folks that we have that are in line to be hired equally in the communication. And don't forget to follow up with the Metropolitan Community Colleges. As we well. already have. Good. That All was right. that was done yesterday. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Executive Services Bureau, Deputy Chief Derek McCullum. Good morning, Commissioners and Mr. Mayor. Morning. All items for the Executive Services Bureau are located under tab E of your board book. <clears throat> Item A, budget transfers for fiscal year 2022-23. I request general fund, community policing and prevention fund, police drug enforcement fund, and police grant fund transfers. The general fund transfer moves 2.2 million within personal services provide pro appropriations for the newly created Community Engagement Division, Metro Patrol Division, and East Patrol Division. All appropriations are for salaries. The Community Policing and Prevention Fund transfers uh, moves 291,000 within personal services to provide appropriations for school resource officer salaries. The Police Drug Enforcement Fund transfer moves 33,000 from contractual services and 99,000 from commodities to personal services. The total transfer is 132,000. The police grant fund transfer moves 72,396 from personal services and 20,245 from commodities in the amounts of 37,641 to contractual services and 55,000 to capital outlay. Police Drug Enforcement Fund and Police Grant Fund transfers adjust appropriations to where they are needed now compared to when they were estimated in the fall of 2021 as the budget was being put together. If you do not have any questions, I recommend approval. I move approval. Second. It's been moved and second. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I said it. Item B, adjustment to special revenue accounts for fiscal year 2022-23. It is requested that $67,560 be appropriated from the unappropriated fund balance of the Special Services Fund to pay the cost of the online reporting system annual license support fee. If you don't have any questions, I do recommend approval. I move approval. Second. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Aye. 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 I heard one eye over there, so I'm like, all right. <laughs> so moved. Item C, adjustment to special revenue accounts for fiscal year 2022-23. It is requested that 550000 
be appropriated from the unappropriated fund balance of the liability self-retention fund for liability settlements. If you do not have any questions, I do recommend approval. Well, I have a question. I don't know if this is the place, but liability made me think of it. We asked for a report about getting insurance. Is this a time to talk about it? It is. I can, I can update you on that. Um, it has been a long process. Our uh, professional staff has been working very diligently on this. Um, Lockton is um, the one putting this together and they will be putting out the RFP. Um, they initially asked for five, uh, five years of data. Um, once we got that, then it went to seven and then finally 10 years of data. And what they're asking for is what, how many lawsuits we've had and accidents and that. Yes. Okay. And, it, and it's not as easy as it sounds. We've had to go through our system. We've had to reach out to, um, Ms. Peters with the, um, uh, AG's office. Um, to get these numbers. So we finally um, able to get them everything they need. And they assure us that the RFP is going out and we should have something by February's board meeting. I, I appreciate the, the question from Commissioner Dean. Um, I guess the, the, the facts are the facts. And if that's when they can get it for us, it's it's fine. I mean, in connection with the budget process, it'd be helpful to have that information, you know, yes, today. Um, so we can all make plans relating to that. I guess in your conversations, she's much better cross-examination than I am, but I, I might ask a few leading ones. Have they indicated to you that this is something that is appropriate or reasonable for police departments to evaluate? As, as far as the, the data that insurance oh it is but i i mean i just have a feeling it it's going to be very costly um they're selling insurance they're going to say this is a great <laughs> right. idea right. 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 Exactly. Right. So, i mean i that, that's interesting i mean because i don't know we have a we've had a long relationship with locked in for insurance in other areas correct mm -hmm. Yes, they're currently doing our um health insurance right now and, and there are concerns when we reach um, when we talk about sole source or that sort of thing, but at no point have we discussed with Locked and perhaps them providing us a proposal on insurance. Is that accurate? Have we asked them at any point about if they want to just work up for us rather than an RFP, just a proposal of what costs might be to insure the Kansas City Police Department? And I don't believe that. I don't believe they do that. I okay. they have to send it out for. I don't, I don't think that's there. Lockton's more of a broker than a... a right. Um, and then in terms of the RFP, do you have an indication yet on how long that might be? Is that a 45, 60-day type period, or are they going with a more extensive one? Well, I mean, if we're going to have it by the end of the month, <laughs> uh, for a next board <clears throat> meeting, it's going to be a, a quick turnaround. I could ask about when we're going to get the RFP or how much time people would have to then to respond, respond. to respond. I'm sorry. We, um, we hope to have something by the um, the end of February for but this. You're, you're saying February. the RFP will be issued. You'll have a draft RFP for our review that we could then submit to the world by the end of February as opposed no, to this, responses. No, I'm hoping to have the, the responses and everything by the end of the. So you're hoping Lockton will issue an RFP before the end of February and have responses back by Correct. the end of February. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's very fast. But so will we, get well. to see the, all right, will we get to see the RFP before it's released? I don't believe so. I don't think we typically send the RFP. We, Locked we in will be sending. They, they will send it out yeah. because we're, yes. we're going through them. This isn't our normal RFP process. We're locked in as our broker. So if we want to so see it, we can can't we? I would hope. I mean, I don't see why not. Yeah, okay. we could. Have them send it to us. Let us look at it. All okay. Right. And, and don't this stop anything. Don't slow right. down. Right. But I'm, I'm just saying, just be mindful that this, yes, it'll, if we're putting the brakes on, are you saying we still want to go forward, but you just want to see a copy yeah, of absolutely. it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Right. All righty. Thank you. <laughs> are, are there any other cities that, that have this insurance in place that we know of? I'm not. I'm not aware of any any other cities. Um, 
from, no. from what I think we've seen, right, it's usually a, either a smaller community might or something of that mm. sort. Usually mm. the larger the department, the less likely it is. That being said, there's much more discussion now because police departments nationwide and cities writ large are facing very substantial legal costs and settlements that, for example, our peers in Kansas City, Kansas, I believe, have a roughly $20 million settlement relating to um, an incarceration of a gentleman ultimately released that came back to the unified government as a cost, which required them to go out, I think, for some sort of type of either bond obligation or something to pay off the settlement. So you're seeing a lot more people actually looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, heaven forbid we don't find cases like that, but when you're talking of 20, $30 million suits in some cities like Chicago, for example, um, and, and I guess I think we have one with at least a request for that much, um, that's that's where we're seeing the change. So um, speed will be helpful in connection with this. And, yes, sir. And perhaps even if someone from Lockton is comfortable speaking to us next board meeting, to inform us of at least their work and their research. I'd imagine they have some expertise, at least more than we might in the field. I, I'd, I'd certainly welcome them, probably more for a closed session discussion, but in the- You, you bet, we'll uh, we'll reach out and, and see Thank if we can get them in here for this. Um, and, and, and to your point, Mr. Mayor, that I mean, this is a nationwide trend. I mean, police departments across the nation um, are seeing unprecedented um, lawsuits and settlements so it's not just unique to to our department it's it's happening all across the, the nation but thank you all right we need a motion on this i move approval second all in favor by senator aye aye, aye. all opposed by no really i have been so moved <laughs> um communicate or item d communications update um we currently have 36 dispatchers and 30 call takers. That's down 34 from where we need to be. We currently have 25 candidates in the hiring process and seven have received a conditional job offer. Um, we do have a class for call takers starting on February 13th. And just so you know, and to the mayor's point, I know he's he's always um, on us to let's reach out to our surrounding areas and our neighbors and see who we can we can find that um, that we can bring on board. And and we've been able to do that with uh, with one coming from a neighboring agency who went through our process for a supervisor position and um, will be coming on and and being a supervisor in the communications unit. So tell me why this is in your bureau and not in HR. Well, I mean, well, communications works for, for me. So I'm just giving the update on their okay. numbers. Yes. I mean, we, I talk with deputy chief Niemeyer and we, we just had a meeting this morning. We're going to tweak some things on, on our reporting because we, we track things a little bit differently um, in our division than HR does. And we want to make sure that we're giving you consistent information. Um, when we talk about how many are in the process, we, we have to handle a process on our end with the critical, with interviews, and then they go back to HR for um, additional processing. So it's, it's a lot of back and forth. They receive the initial um, application, they send it to us, and then we do our portion and then send it back to them. So anything slowing up the process oh no ma'am no ma'am i mean this this has to be done i mean it, it this First process has to be it it was good coming from there and coming here mm -hmm. i i know where the i know where the holds up was is fixing it right that's that's all that's, i care about we have seven as as mccomb just said we have seven already okay. they're being hired i want it Thank you. And there's the ones that he said are in the process much faster. Good, good. Because I will I will ask this as a, an addendum on to Commissioner Dean's question. Uh, and I appreciate your recent experience there, which will help. Because just because we have the different bureaus that touch this process, I would encourage you to evaluate whether we always need to do it that way. There are a number of, uh, I just know on the city side of operations, where frankly, going from fire to HR 
greatly slows down our ability to hire. And I know at least that department's wishing to be able to be more efficient with it. I know there are things that need to be done and getting people on the books and all of that, but I, I would encourage us to evaluate that as we can. I think where, where we're going and, and, and I, we've talked uh, in the last couple of weeks, it's, I know many of you have been back there um, in a meeting back there in the communications unit takes a special kind of person to be able to do that. And you are correct. I think everybody here realizes we can't just hire anyone and, and place them back there. We're, we're not only doing that person a disservice, we're doing our citizens a disservice. We're doing everyone a disservice. Um, I've said it a, a hundred times. I cannot do that job. I would not be capable of doing that job. So the, the process starts out. Um, we have on the HR side have, uh, place that a tracking system so that we know where everyone in the process is at any, you can call me at any time and I can tell you exactly where they're at in their process. But it, it has to start out with their application coming in and they go to communications because they need to evaluate, can this person handle the situations that they're going to be placed in? Um, then it comes back to HR and we can get them through that much quicker now than we did before. But that's how it starts out before Deputy Chief McCollum said they, their number would be one thing. Ours would be not, that's going to stop. We will know where everyone is daily. Well, and you're right that it requires a special person. And one of the reasons that I've talked to the communications unit employees, you said that that's the best person to recruit is somebody in those folks know what a hard job it is and what it requires. And if they know somebody else, that could do that job, they need to recruit them. And that's why we are incentivizing, I hate that word, we're giving incentives to people to try and recruit. So if the communications people are watching, recruit your friends and neighbors that you think are able to do that job. Thank you. Um, that leads actually, is a lead into my next part. Um, several things that we are doing um, in the communications unit to recruit. Um, Manager Hoskins has reached out to the uh, uh, KC Public School District to get in front and discuss with their uh, guidance counselors on um, potential career path for graduating seniors. So we're working our way into the Kansas City School District and depending on how this goes, potentially reaching out to other uh, school districts. I think it's a it's going to be a good start. Um, we're also exploring options, and I didn't talk to Deputy Chief uh, Niemeyer about it yet, but um, working with Casey ATA on what it would cost to purchase one of the billboards that goes on the side of their buses to let them know that we're hiring um, dispatchers also for law enforcement as well but but i think the idea those buses are all over the city um and they're in the areas uh, where we want to attract uh, folks so i think that's a good idea that's just uh, beginning discussion so um i look forward to getting an update on that and i provide it for you um another um um recruiting uh, option that that manager hoskins uh informed me about was what they call a each one reach five campaign within the communications unit. Um, it's to, to encourage our communications uh, unit personnel to try to recruit five, uh, five people reach out to their friends and it's already paid off. Um, so far we've gotten two applications um, submitted from friends of communications unit uh, personnel. We really drive home the financial incentive you know, it's $500 uh, for each person that you get in that successfully goes through the uh, process and gets and gets hired on. Um, and, you know, they can each get five people um, be sitting uh, sitting well. But um, anyway, so they have the five uh, each uh, communications unit personnel has five recruitment cards that they've gotten from personnel and they're and they're handing those out and, and see if we can we can get good folks in. Um, 
As um, assistant manager uh, Basil let you know, she's been um, going to the full employment council, um, working closely with that organization to, to get some members in the door. Um, she's also attending um, job fairs with our um, human resources recruiters. And um, another option or another idea that we've come up with is partnering with uh, Mark, um, who obviously you know does a 911 system to uh, have a joint job fair with them. So that's some of the things that we're working on uh, with our partners. So we're hopeful that that combination of these will pay off and we'll get more people in the door. As Dep Deputy Chief Niemeyer said, it's, it's a difficult job. It has more of a turnover rate than than we have for uh, for patrol. It, it's not an easy task, but. Um, we're doing everything we can to get the right people in the door and in those seats. Um, do you have any questions on, on that? Another, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Another thing I was thinking about, I know we had talked about in the past, is the chambers working with us. Has anybody reached out to the chambers? Because I know they do newsletters like monthly to the business owners and kind of putting it out there. Maybe they could put something in that for us or... Um, I I don't know. I'm I'm still getting my my feet planted. Um, it's been very eye opening. Um, you know, is similar to what Doug was saying. You know, I worked in the fiscal division and didn't really know a lot about what you know right. some of the additional uh, divisions I picked up um, actually did in detail. So I'm learning my way around. I don't know if we have. I think it's a good idea, but I will follow up and and find out. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to see how quickly we can get to the level where we don't require mandatory overtime. People have child care situations and things. We were talking about the child care situation, Chief. So how quickly do you think we can get to a place where we don't require mandatory overtime? Well, I mean, if we can if we can get the 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 people in once we get up to uh the staffing i mean 34 is a lot of people to to make up um you know the class alone classroom is is five weeks long um and then you have another 14 weeks of on the job training now sometime depending on how they are doing then uh, you know they're not under the intense um oversight of a, of a trainer and they have a little bit more i think latitude to to do more of the um, job without the constant supervision, but um, it's it's a long process. To answer your question, um, we'll look into what we have in the process right now. We'll also contact our communications unit <clears throat> to see what that magic number is to where it reduces the mandatory overtime. I mean, it, it might be another 10, 15 to where at least if that could even that out to where there's, we can get some shifts covered where, where it's not mandatory. Yeah, I know that's difficult, especially for our, our single parent that, that work in our communications. And I know we're going to bring that up here in a little bit, too, about the child care. Um, give you an update. There's no real um, that need to be voted on or anything. But um, the uh, ETAC executive board, which the ETAC is the emergency <coughs> emerging threat analysis uh, capability, they voted to move the fiduciary data to the city of Lenexa. This makes sense in our opinion because uh, their police department currently heads the board. Um, when that um, occurs, the department is in the process of finalizing all the documents and we estimate sending to that, uh, sending to them $373,295 dollars. Um, which is the balance of the fund. That's not KCPD money. I mean, we have a portion that we contribute to uh, ETAC, but they will just run the uh, fiduciary part and take us out of it. Um, radio update. We had a meet, uh, meet and greet two weeks ago with uh, um, our team and the team from Motorola on February 2nd. We are meeting here at police headquarters with their technical teams and ours um, to discuss infrastructure and the technical side of the um, project. 
we'll keep you updated as we move along in the process. But that's what I have right now. And unless you have any questions, completes my report. And did we complete that MOU with with the board and the city for the radios? Yes. That's yes. Completed. Yes. Yep. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, thank you, Chief Officer. Chief Office Executive Officer, Deputy Chief Steve Young. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we don't have any policies for approval today, but I can say that we recently wrapped up all the agreements with Lexapol. And so very shortly, we're going to start having meetings with them to see what it actually looks like to, to work with them. So it's completely new to us. We don't know what that'll look like, but uh, we're excited to get them on board and, and help us with our policy process. Um, it was hit on just a moment ago, but I know that there were some questions asked in the past about child care. So I know this chief has a little bit to add, but on my end, our research and development crew, they looked into it. And out of all the peer cities that they reached out to, I think there's ballpark 30, somewhere around there. Uh, there was only one that actually had anything like child care, and that was San Diego. And when they started looking into that deeper, so it is completely outside their department supported. It's a foundation funded. It's uh, managed through somebody outside of the San Diego Police Department. Um, and it's with a partnership with a national child care uh, daycare organization. So uh, the only real link to the San Diego Police Department is that it's exclusive to children of, of first responders. So they don't manage it. They don't fund it. They just get to send their kids there. That'd be great. It would be. Yes, it would be. But that's that's on my end. Go ahead, Chief. So we had a meeting, I think it was my second or third week in, and we had members of our department along with a, a community member who has her own child care here. Uh, through that, one of the sergeants, Sergeant Nicole Wright, she had researched a child care facility, for lack of a better words, in Arizona. It was born out of a memorial for a woman whose whose husband was a police officer who was killed in the line of duty. As a result of that um, tragedy, she formed a child care for first responders. That is also somewhat outside funded. So we're looking at different options. We're going to have to have a partnership with someone outside of KCPD. It will have to be open to all first responders and city workers there will have to be some kind of funding source to assist in that, um, to include if it's not a, an already freestanding childcare facility, either creating one of our own, but I think it, it would probably be best if we could partner with a an, an already in existence childcare facility, which I know President Tolbert, we, we talked a little bit about that. We had a meet and greet with some uh, Missouri legislators. During that conversation, we did have one of the legislators contact me specifically talking about child care and the potential for funding. So we're exploring that conversation. So a lot of it is, well, I feel like the last meeting we had, we've really made progress as far as looking exactly what our measurables need to be, but we're it's still a work in progress. And it, you know, it, it can't happen soon enough, but it's something that we're continuing to talk about, explore, and see if we can identify, you know, the literal brick and mortar uh, location or partnership and also funding sources. So we're exploring those and I'll, I should have an update for you soon. But you're looking at more than just police, but other first. Yes, responders. it would have to be. Okay. Well, I think that makes sense. We're not the only uh, entity that has those pressures. Yeah. In public service, it's shift work. Yeah. It's shift work. So that's, and that is what this type of child care would be serving. We're still looking into that for sure. Don't drop that ball, please. Nope. Not Thank getting you. dropped. Not on my watch. Thank you. And that's all I had, Commissioner. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Office of General Counsel, Ms. Holly Dodge. Good morning. morning. My information is found under tab F. First, we have our summary. If there are no questions, I can go into the appeal. 
I have no questions. No questions. In the mm -hmm. appeal, we are requesting to uphold the denial of an unarmed private security license. There's only one case submitted to you today. Right. I move that we uphold the appeal, uh, the, the, the earlier decision. By uphold the, the denial. Uphold the denial. Thank you. Second. We're moving second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I said it. So moved. That's all I have. Thank you. Office of Community Complaints, Director Merrill Bennigan. Commissioner Dean, since you uh, made the comment, I decided to put my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I cannot take credit for it. So uh, I, I blame Colonel Maven. Thank you. Um, make me do work back there. But this is great. <laughs> Worked his magic. Indeed. Indeed. So uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Office of Community Complaints has provided to you in advance uh, copies of its monthly reports for December 2022, uh, the fourth quarter 2022 uh, report, and also the uh, semi-annual uh, statistical reports for July 2022 through December of 2022, uh, which are located under tab G uh, in your board books or on your electronic devices. At this time, I would just provide you uh, with the most significant highlights of OCC's activities from the semi-annual report for the second half of uh, calendar year 2022. Let me also add that uh, these numbers are somewhat preliminary as we're still processing uh, work from uh, last year, um, and historically, those numbers in every category have skewed upward. Uh, so we will give an update um, as we continue to work through um, the statistical data uh, from last year. Uh, for the last two quarters of 2022, the office received a total of 129 complaints. Uh, the OCC submitted uh, for formal investigation uh, 75 of the complaints received to the Internal Affairs Unit. Um, these complaints uh, were in the areas of uh, three bias-based uh, policing complaints, uh, five discourtesy complaints, 11 complaints in the area of excessive use of force, four harassment complaints, 10 complaints involving improper member conduct, and 42 complaints um, alleging improper procedure. 54 complaints were classified as non-investigated, meaning that they were either resolved uh, without investigation, um, meaning it could have been either mediation, conciliation, or some other uh, means to resolve it. Uh, result, uh, they were either withdrawn or the complainant failed to cooperate. Or the complaint could have been closed due to a lack of jurisdiction, um, no observed or actionable violation of policy or procedure, uh, pending litigation, et cetera. Uh, there were additional four complaints that were initiated in the first, um, I'm sorry, in the second half of 2022 uh, no, I'm sorry, the first half of 22 to 2022 that were carried over in the second half um, that would increase that number of NICs from 54 uh, to 58. Additionally, during the second half of 2022, uh, the Board of Police Commissioners um, and the Chief of Police reviewed and concurred on 68 recommendations rendered um, by the OCC and fully investigated by the Internal Affairs Unit. Uh, the concurrences by the Board and the Chief were on 14 not sustained recommendations 11 exonerations, and one sustained recommendation. The Internal Affairs investigation of 18 other complaints uh, during this reporting period were terminated either for non-cooperation by the complainant, complainants or they were voluntary withdrawn. Uh, that ends my statistical report. And again, uh, these numbers preliminary in nature as we are still wrapping up some work from 2022, and we will update this report um, in the following weeks. Um, also, or do you have any questions at this time? Any questions regarding the statistical reports? All right. Not uh, necessarily report, sure. but just uh, general information. Mm -hmm. So I know that in the past we uh, put together some kind of a um, determination that officers could 
report to your uh, department sure. without having to go through the chain of command. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is disseminated throughout the department? Um, it's It was disseminated informally because the process is, is still in the formal one because there are always going to be um, HR concerns. Um, the process that you're talking about is whenever we saw a member or, or a member observed something that a num another member did that would be questionable in regards to uh, contact with a member of the public. Um, and so informally, that process has been working. We have been receiving notifications and uh, those matters have been addressed through the office of the chief of police. Um, but as far as that being codified in a policy and procedure, no, um, it, is not it is not a formal policy at this time. It's just something um, that we made that was distributed and um, to the to the membership, I think that was uh, at least a year, a year and a half ago. We do have in policy, though, that if an officer witnesses something, you know, alleged or conduct by another officer, they can report it to their supervisor, to any other supervisor or go direct to a county prosecutor or the U.S. attorney's office. That's codified in policy that they don't have to necessarily go to their direct supervisor if they don't feel comfortable doing that. Now, what. Uh, Director Binnikin's talking about, you know, going to directly to OCC. I mean, it, OCC might not be spelled out, but it, it's implied. But I mean, there is a, a definite pathway saying that officer can go straight to, uh, you know, the county prosecutor if they, they see something that's criminal in nature. So that is already spelled out. Yeah, I, I think we have to spell it out because whenever you're dealing with something like that, if there are some gray areas, usually the gray area and fall toward the employee. Right. Well, they can also go directly to uh, HR Confidential, which is uh, check daily. So there are a lot of checks and balances. I mean, we can add OCC to that, but I don't want the impression to be given that officers have to go through their direct chain to report uh, violations. That is, is completely incorrect. And we do have it spelled out and continually report um, continually address that and encourage that during our meetings with officers and in service. And the chief just did that with the upper command staff and a meeting the other, other week. So, I mean, that's something that we're constantly working on. And I, I concur with the uh, Colonel, um, the, the, the instances that we've, that's come to us thus far have been those where um, we took a look at a situation and we just had a conversation and basically counseled uh, the member who was reporting to us, the options that were available that, um, uh, Colonel Maven just just laid out. Uh, to be totally honest with you, none of them have been pure in that it it you know for the intention that that the board came up with from the board table. None of those it didn't meet that criteria. It really involved other issues that were more appropriate for the other pathways that the colonel just laid out. So um, we we can continue those discussions. But I said we it's it's not something that has been an ongoing thing or ongoing concern for this office. informal way for officers to get the perspective of the Office of Citizen Complaints and not have to talk to anybody in the chain of command. And it's anonymous, right? And that they may trust the Office of, of Community Complaints um, more to keep that confidential, I don't know. But I think it's, it's good to have another place for those officers to get counsel and know what their options are. But I think it needs to be in some way official so that there can't be a backlash to the officers if something is found oh, out. Okay. That that's my concern. We we have we have some language that um came, that was derived from the conversations between myself, the officer of the general counsel, and also the secretary attorney. Uh, so I'll just pull that back out and I'll shoot um, Attorney Kenner or Coffey, and we'll we'll see um, if what we had put together um, to make sure that our whole concern we didn't want to um, interrupt any other processes that were available and make sure that we were acting within the law as well. Right. Um, so I'll just I'll, I'll work with um, Attorney Kenner and Office of General Counsel, and we'll we'll get something together for you. And just to just to even more reiterate, creating a culture of accountability here at KCPD that was. That was the, the conversation and the reason for bringing in our entire command staff this past week to make sure that everyone is encouraged 
and is expected and the, that that there are that there will be an environment that everyone feel comfortable to to say what needs to be said um, immediately. I know I'm going a little bit far off the topic here, but I think we're all on the same line um, to to prevent situations from ha- happening and also having the duty to intervene. So those were huge conversations and and expectations that were set at from the top down just this past week. So if there's another avenue, so be it. Okay, I'm getting them. You're good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, lastly, um, as you can see up on the screen, uh, the ninth annual Badges and Baseball event is this coming Saturday. Uh, we're excited. Uh, this year, we've had the assistance of the newly created uh, Community Engagement Division to help us with the planning and facilitation of this. Um, um, we're exp- we're going to have two sessions this year, uh, the first one being from 10 to noon and the second one from noon to 2. The first session will be for our younger kids um, up through the early junior high grades, and then the second uh, session will be f- uh, for the older, uh, more appropriate for the high, junior high and teenagers. Um, we're going to be talking about um, how to interact with police officers. We're having someone from the traffic unit come and talk about traffic stops, um, how to do that to answer any questions. It's a, it's a very open and um, transparent interaction that we have. And um, I just pray that no one asks me to uh, perform any baseball skills. It's not my sport. <laughs> It's not what I do, <laughs> but uh, we, we, we're, we're looking forward to it. And um, again, uh, we're still accepting signups. And uh, this is in conjunction with the Kansas City Royals organization and the Urban Youth Academy. And um, we're just really excited about this uh, this upcoming event. You talk to them about seat belts. Yes, that is a big, that is a big part of the, uh, the traffic presentation, indeed. And, and Mara, I don't want to interrupt because I think that badges for baseball has, has been amazing. And you don't know this yet, and I don't like to – or things on folks, but uh, for the for the young women out there, Lexi, Allison, and Brooke all coach at the Urban Youth Academy, the softball teams. Oh, wonderful. And they just asked me about this a couple of weeks ago and said, wonderful. again, Dad, why does the police department not have something for our softball players? So that's coming. You know, so that we have that for the young women who are playing softball at the Urban Youth Academy because they all coach the Royals – Right. team so we had that, we that. actually had that discussion during the planning meeting because we said well uh we need to have some a continuation throughout the year for mm-hmm. the other sports it might be kickball badges and kickball i don't know uh, badges and pickleball i don't know but uh, softball i think that's an excellent tie-in and i'll be sure to uh, mention that to um, um to our, our our planning committee and uh, hopefully we'll have some other events going on throughout the year and but We've had young ladies at the Badges and Baseball events, so sure. they're more than welcome to attend that as well. Well, they will be – I'm going to send them your way because they right. asked me – they just asked me Sounds um, good. why why they don't have a, a soft Badges and Softball. So, Lexi Hansen will be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, if there's nothing else, Commissioners, that's all that I have. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right, we have public comments. Uh, do we have a clock? Are they putting a clock up here on the board? We're asking you to observe uh, two minutes. There are quite a few people on the list. So Matt Nelson is up first, followed by Rachel Thomas. Everybody, uh, thank you for being. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's the first, it's the first time for everything, but I never thought I'd be here in front of you all. As a child, three to four, I had to learn that the people who are supposed to love you and make sure you're safe feed feed you and all the things parents and un- parents, aunts and uncles and cousins were supposed to do. But it's funny they didn't. It didn't go like that. As we grow, as a result, I grew up in foster care, only to get the same treatment. And the rest is history: mental illness, drugs, and prison. Trying to figure out what to do or why I wasn't loved. I said, though, I said all that to say this: those who are supposed to protect us fail, and they are failing miserably. 
we are responsible and must be held accountable. Um, sometimes we must look back at our past to re-educate ourselves and remind ourselves how far we have come, but at the same time, how much we have lost. I remember interacting with the KCPD, giving me baseball cards. I felt okay. I didn't know how other people felt at that time. Now I feel our kids feel from witnessing how we are treated by the police that baseball cards we don't get no more. Now, now 10 and 14 year old black males are suspects. There's a lot to be done. Mental illness, drugs, the feeling of hopelessness in the minds of people that I know trapped, no way to get out, no affordable housing. It's not hard for y'all to see what's going on. Let's talk more action. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Thomas. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then I came, then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Ashley Fulkerson, Johnny Harris Jr., Tyrone Holman, Donnie Sanders, James McNeil Jr., Javon Hawkins, Yamal Irwin, Eugene Williams, Terry Davis, Timothy Wilson Jr., Anthony Bruno, Kevin Ellis, Jessica Jones, Cameron Lamb, Travis Griffin, Christopher Henley, Anthony Champion, Terrence Bridges Jr., Ryan Stokes, Michael Ray Bitters, Carl Marshall, John Lewis, Malcolm Johnson, Sean Wilson, Juan Merez, Aaron Doherty, Kenneth Drew, Kenny Gurley, Daryl Morris, Cesar Mora Zapata. Graves, I believe this is the first time you've heard only some of the 150 plus names of people that should be alive. You have yet to pay your respects for those who should be alive. Now, as chief of police, in an interview, you're saying you're reaching out to everyone. You had two and a half years to walk down those steps before you were chief, and now you still haven't. I'm not shocked. I'm not disappointed. I'm calling you out. Everyone loves that first they came for a poem but no one seems to understand. It means that the best form of self-protection is investing in the well-being of people who are more marginalized than you are, so that it will, so that it never gets to that point. Thank you. Lawsuits against police across the country being unprecedented, translated, Police violence across the country unprecedented. Thank you. Stan Morgan, followed by, I think it's Scott Meyer. Good morning. Good morning. In November, when we spoke to you here, one of you said you had received a letter asking for dialogue about police reform and that you would get back with us. We've never heard from you. Despite a number of emails and phone calls with voicemails, messages left. Why don't you want to talk with us? What harm can come from dialogue about a timely subject here and everywhere in the nation, reform in policing policies and practices? We have had two meetings scheduled with another of your members, yet both times the night before the meetings were canceled. Why? Are you a fearful of sincere dialogue? 
is the same kind of last minute cancellation going to be repeated at our next scheduled meeting in February? What bad results could possibly emerge from a simple dialogue? Or is it that you just don't want to talk with us? Or maybe you would want, or, or maybe you would like to speak with two other members of our team. Can you tell me the names of the people you had meetings scheduled with that were canceled? I'm sorry. Hello, my name is Karen Daniels. I'm the great niece of Boston Daniels, the first black chief of police in Kansas City, Kansas, appointed in 1970, making him the first black chief of police in the nation of a major city. Boston Daniels practiced what we are seeking, police reform for the benefit of the community and the police. Chief Graves, board, deputy chiefs, chief counsel, I am Brother John. If not for myself, who will be for me? As a motivational storyteller, podcast producer, journalist, uh, there's four points that I uh, live by and work with. That's diversity, inclusiveness, knowledge of who I deal with. Is. I want to know more about the unity, which wrapped up through dialogue. And uh, yes, in my life, I've had several uh, bitter experiences with of law enforcement and personnel, some individuals. The old term goes like one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. But I've had the great opportunity through what I do is to be able to experience of uh, the wonderful, as uh, the deputy chief said, uh, the best recruits are our employees. And I have there's several individuals who have had that great opportunity to show what representing what the community is, a part of the community from a human experience, uh, particularly in reference of even like two, uh, three years ago with the Chiefs Parade. Dr. Mirning and doing some work down there as far as the community, what was going on there. And I ran into an officer and uh, we got into dialogue. And I, it uh, lowered my inhibitions and my anxiety level. And it uh, made me feel, wow, that's a human being. He's a servant. We serve each other. We help each other part of the community, a very important part of the community. And he's with me and I'm with them as well. And there was so much love and community there as well. And so I asked him, can I take a selfie? He said, absolutely. And then he said, you know what? This feels good. This is a great vibe. I'm loving this. This is great for the community for Kansas City. I want to see more of this. I said, you really do? I said, absolutely. How about you, Brother John? I said, I do too. And maybe we'll do it again. And perhaps in two weeks, I may have that opportunity <laughs> to engage in that dialogue. And I'd just like to say, um, what if there were more black women on the police force, uh, black officers, black women officers promoted in the police department. Don't you think we have a point of view? Wouldn't we be the change that you would like to see in the police force? Thank you. So your name is Delmyra? Are you Delmyra Daniels? No, no. Oh, that's you. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I would, because I- Daniels. All right, because I was giving you the extra minutes because Stan Morgan and uh, Meyer put their time together. Okay, all right, thank you all. So we sent letters to all of you at one time, um, maybe but, two months ago. Right, and I heard we don't really We don't really want to name who isn't responding. We just hope you'll respond. No. <laughs> We're I, not trying to embarrass anybody. No, no, no. You said you had meetings scheduled yeah. with us. With, and they, with, were, with one and they were canceled, and I'm not aware of one meeting that I had scheduled that I didn't attend. The, my actual statement here is that there was a meeting scheduled with one of you. Okay. Thank you. Darmyra Daniels? Get my uh, Cadillac on this side. Oh. 
Good, mor good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Delmita Corliss Kamehameha. Uh, I am uh, a um, vice president of the Gray Panthers. And uh, when I came before you, I believe I see the faces I remember, except for the Honorable uh, Reverend there and also the new mayor. Um, but I was a little younger when I came before you before. I'm a little older now, so... Uh, I've had a lot of experience dealing with the police. I am a Citizens Police Academy cadet, which I'm honored to be. We were probably the first ones that you started with a long time ago. So any of you stop me, this is what you're going to see. I'm going to hand this out to you when you stop me for a traffic ticket, okay? But anyway, uh, I wanted to say that we wanted, I remember, I don't know if they're still here or not. There was a husband and wife team that were uh, the chief, I think she's the mayor of a city now, a, a small town in Kansas City, but she was a, our trainee and her husband was a police officer. They were very kind and I learned a lot. Uh, but I wanted to say we wanted the Citizens Police Academy cadet to be more than just uh, coffee and donuts because we learned a lot of what policemen go through. And I wanted uh, us to be like a lesion between the community and the, and, and the police department. And we wanted to be like, you know, more on the uh, walking in the community, helping the police, maybe uh, going forward and uh, giving our reports to the police chief. By the way, I don't, do we have a new police chief? Yes, we do. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, hi, congratulations <laughs> uh, on your appointment. You've got a big schedule I and mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on. But uh, anyway, I hope that we'll have an opportunity uh, as a Citizens Police Academy cadet and vice president of the Great Panthers to talk to the chief and deputy chief about our concerns about seniors, how, how policemen approach seniors. Now, I'm not saying, uh, when you use your baton, when you use your uh, maze, whatever, I'm not saying, I know none of you would, would hit uh, an 80 year old woman with a baton, but I'm just saying we need to talk about these things because when you're dealing with seniors, you're dealing with uh, concerns that are different than young people. And uh, so, you know, they can have a heart attack. Or do you know when someone is deaf, when you start saying, come out of the car and put your hand, well, see, we can't do all that. You know, I can't do it. So I would probably be shot. But what I mean is I'm trying to say is I can't do all those different things that you're asking. So you have to be sure that you know that a person is deaf. Maybe we have, can come up with something that would show when you stop someone that they're deaf or if they have a disability or if they're osteoporosis, whatever the case may be. And uh, that's, that's what my concern is, is that we, we come together and let the police know that seniors have a little more concerns than the young people that you stop or whatever that is. And uh, so I hope that we can get together with you on that. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank, thank you. you very much. Nice seeing, yeah, all of you I've seen except you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Tracy Scott. Okay. Okay. Second here. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm here to speak on an incident that happened to me on Wednesday, January 11th, near Brush Creek Boulevard around 2.45 p.m. 
I was driving and I encountered a white SUV that was facing me. We locked eyes and all of a sudden my car was being shot at. I had no idea who this person was. He was hanging out the passenger side of the vehicle shooting at my car. I don't live a life of crime. I was just going about my day, taking care of business just like any other day. I had to duck down to avoid being shot. He was about 30 feet from me. When I ducked down, I saw him raise his assault rifle with intentions to shoot me. Thank God I, I didn't get shot. I sped away as fast as I could. I called 911 when I got to safety. Officers responded and said that their shot spotter went off and other vehicles were shot, were struck. I just wanted to say that crime is running rampant and that not everyone shot and killed know their suspects. Um, I printed out pictures uh, as if anyone is interested in what my car looks like. I am pleading that something be done to keep these types of things from happening to law-abiding citizens. Now I'm considering purchasing a gun. I never thought that I would have to do that. Thank you. Um, uh, rampant. Uh, Steve Young, Casey Lee. August the 7th, 2022, that's the day that police murdered Zachary Garrard at a busy gas station on 55th and Prospect. That's also the same night Officer Fraser body slammed Mac on his head. So you might not, so you might not have heard about this because KCPD is not one to hold their own accountable. They still refuse to self-report themselves. If KC Leap hadn't witnessed the whole incident and called it on camera, no one would have believed Mac's story. Officer Fraser's encounter with Mr. Nelson at night was over the top and unnecessary. There was no immediate threat to his life or any other officers around him. I was standing behind the police tape and saw everything. Mr. Nelson never raised a hand and never pulled away from the police while Fraser positioned himself behind Mac as if he was going to handcuff him. Out of nowhere, I witnessed Officer Fraser pick Mr. Nelson up and slam him on his head. This was very disturbing and hard to look at. I couldn't keep my emotions under control. My first reaction was to break the police tape and run over there to see if he was okay. But I knew that that would mean a death sentence for me. So I had to stay back and watch them try to revive him. They had to physically lift him up and then he slumped over he eventually had to be transported away by the ambulance. Now, I know that story sounds unbelievable, but it's true. However, KCPD wanted to cover it up completely. They went as far as to lie on the police report. They said that Mac fell on his own, fell on his own, causing his own injuries. When it was witnessed and recorded that he was slammed to the ground. This is a clear dereliction of duty in my eyes. KCPD has shown no integrity, no accountability, and no compassion. They continue to waste the taxpayers' money on preventable lawsuits. The victim was already dehumanized and traumatized. Then you double down and lie about the whole thing in hopes the truth wouldn't get out because you knew Mac's story wouldn't be believed over you. However, Casey, however, Casey Leap was there to observe the whole thing. I caught the entire interaction on video. The, the police report is a flat out lie and it proves that KCPD needs a complete overhaul due to the corruption and toxic culture. I want you to remember the name KC Lee. 
It stands for Kansas City Law Enforcement Accountability Project. Remember us, because we're only growing in large, we only, we're, we're only growing larger in numbers. We are the eyes and the voice of the community, and we will be at all police involved shootings by KCPD. We also are investigating all excessive use of force claims that come through our hotline. We have the ear of the excessive use of force unit of the prosecutors. So if you refuse to hold your own accountable, don't worry, because we got you. We'll make sure it happens. Thank you. General discussion from Chief uh, Stacy Grace. I'm just gonna, I'll make this quick. Uh, thank you for the honor to lead the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department as Chief of Police. I'm humbled to serve the men and women of this department in our city. And, I've, and as I've said before, as Chief of Police, I will lead the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department in providing a collaborative, community-focused and professional service to our city's residents and visitors. Providing a clear vision and strategy to lead our city's police force to reduce violent crime, build trust through community engagement, increase accountability and transparency while providing equitable and fair service to all. Today is my 28th actual working day. I have been busy each day meeting with community and civic leaders, prosecutors, uh, setting meetings with city council, attending neighborhood meetings, visiting with our KCPD members and many other organizations. And there are still many that I still need to meet with. All are doing great work in our city to help people, all in hopes of creating a safer Kansas City. There's no simple solution to violent crime in our city. We have a, um, a culture of violence in our country. We can't di get distracted by issues that shift our focus away from the clear lack of value of human life and humanity in general. Working together collectively is the only way we can be a safer, successful community to combat violent crime at its core, to improve quality of life, and to really share the community we all want and need. Uh, we are meeting with our executive staff this week to begin working on our violent crime reduction strategy. Over the past month, we've built an executive team that shares the same goals and vision for a safer and inclusive Kansas City. We have met, discussed, and set expectations for a professional police department that values community, accountability, and transparency that is collaborative and results-driven. There are going to be times where where. We may not get it right, but we'll keep coming back to the table and continue working down, working on breaking down this adversarial wall that has existed between police and community as, as evidence in some of our comments today. We will elevate the image of policing right here in Kansas City, sparking a positive policing movement. I have faith we have a police department with members who feel valued and supported both internally and externally. That is how I measure success where our members feel valued and supported by this organization and the community and our community and city values and supports our members and Kansas City is a safer place as a result. All of this won't happen overnight and some may not know it or feel it, but we have, we've already gotten started. It's time to speak life to each other, encourage each other to be the best that we can be, to be better humans and treat each other as such. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Thank you again. Thank you for our patience with our big goals. And we have a lot of work to do. And I know that KCPD is up for the challenge. So thank you. Thank you for picking me. And I will take this opportunity. And um, I will make Kansas City a safer place. Thank you. And, and welcome to your first uh, board meeting uh, of, of the year and of your career as chief. Thank you. We're looking forward to um, uh, your success because your success is the success of our city as well. That's right. Anything else? No, sir. All right. Uh, I need approval for open session minutes for December 10th, December 13th, December 15th. I move approval for all of those. Second as to all. It's been moved and second. All in favor by signing by? Aye. All, Aye. Oppo Aye. all opposed <laughs> by no. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kenner? Yes, we have a vacancy for treasurer with the retirement of Commissioner Wagner, and so we need to uh, select somebody for that position. I um, nominate Commissioner Kramer to be the treasurer. Second that nomination. All in favor by signing by? Aye. Aye. Opposed by no? Let's have it. 
Welcome. You. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Kenner? That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Mayor Lucas. Uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate the presentations. Uh, particularly, I'll highlight Deputy Chief Niemeyer's presentation as to recruiting. I'm reminded uh, a little while back, uh, one of my nephews who is in the United States Army was evaluating coming to the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. And as happens with 22, 23-year-old kids, process was a tinge faster for the Army. Happy to serve in our country, but at the same time, it kind of showed me uh, how quickly these things can move. So thank you for recognizing all of that. A few things to note, we do look forward to more information on, on the insurance uh, issue. And I think that will be helpful, at least in giving us direction as to a path. I also have uh, reached out through my staff to Deputy Chief McCollum's division as it relates to our community engagement division budget. Last year, uh, this board and the city council, uh, and thanks to Deputy Chief Niemeyer again, went through a good deal of work creating a uh, community policing and prevention fund. Uh, that I think helped us actually get through our finance committee and other issues. It seems as if, and I appreciate this, uh, Chief, as well as uh, former acting Chief Maben for helping us establish this division, which I think really fulfills the mission of what we had talked about before. And so since we are doing that work and funding it, just looking at what those numbers are so we could represent uh, to city council and the public broadly about a lot of the good permanent community work that we're doing. And I look forward to more information on that. Information for everyone else. Of course, the city budget is introduced next uh, month, early next month, I believe about February 12th. It will then be discussed over the, you're all good, over the six weeks that follow. And uh, that's just about the only interesting thing I have to share. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That, that was your timer button. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> she, she triggered you. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> I've already confessed I'm not good with technology. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Kramer. Well, I think the mayor covered it all. Um, I want to thank everybody, all our new deputy chiefs. Look forward to working with you this year and the new chief. Uh, we're honored to have you. And we were listening to the community, and that's why you got picked. So we're really excited about having you here and uh, working with you so. and the community. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dean? I have nothing. Really? It's additional. <laughs> um, I guess that's me. I have nothing. So we will entertain um, a motion to adjourn from this public meeting and a motion to go into closed session. I move that we adjourn the public meeting and go into closed session. Second. Albert, aye. Dean, aye. Lucas, aye. Kramer, aye. Thank you.